from Lucius Tarquinus Priscus to Servius Tullius, let's talk about the Kings of Rome part 3! <laughs> Hello all you funky people, funky monkey here, welcome and thank you for joining me today. How are you? How have you been? Potato says hi. Another week has just passed and I am really glad that the weekend is here. Now let's get to it. This episode is part 3 about the 7 Roman Kings. In the first one we spoke about the legends around the founding of Rome and its first king, Romulus. Bye, potato. In the second we covered Numa Pompilius, Tullus Hostilius and Ancus Marcius. And now it is time to talk about kings 5 and 6 and the downward spiral that the Roman monarchy started on. Although I tried to avoid it, I couldn't really in the end. I wanted to squeeze the last king in this episode, but there is so much to talk about, so many things to cover when it comes to why the Roman monarchy crashed and burned that the whole topic deserves its own video, just like its foundation deserved its own video. The things I will share with you are not something you were taught in school, in most cases. And there are things that you could use if you are looking for some inspiration for your own world building. So I think it's well worth it to just take our time and for me to give you as much detail as I can. For this episode, like for the previous two, I will heavily rely on the works of Titus Livius Patavinus or Livy ab Urbe Condita from the foundation of the city and on Polybius's work Parallel Lives. We won't go into the merits of the very few surviving sources, but we will be talking about what the 1st century BCE Romans knew about their kings of old. Livy, as I previously mentioned, boasted that his works rely on the state archives <coughs> excuse me, and inscriptions that peppered both Rome and the most important cities in the Italian peninsula, and on oral traditions. Polybius's works most likely rely on that of Livy, seeing how he lived several decades after Livy published his works, but he also had access to the same sources Livy did, and there are some slight differences uh, between the two sources, especially when it comes to numbers. Livy tends to exaggerate the numbers a little bit, while Polybius tends to underestimate or uh, understate the numbers that Livy gives, but the essence is still there, it's still the same. While we'll journey through the history uh, of the end of the Roman monarchy, I will be painting the two automatons I crafted last time. For some context, I needed some weird automatons, robots for my mega dungeon and so I needed to actually make them as I didn't find the necessary or the appropriate miniatures. Um, pretty cool minis in my opinion, especially since they were created by yours truly, a man of many talents, most of them hidden, very well hidden, but I'm quite happy with them. In the lore of my world, these constructs were made by individuals who took on their old gods and actually won, so even if they perhaps look weird, they make sense in my world and I'm very happy with the results, or at least that is the official story I'm going with. They are weird because they make sense in my world. Now. Before we jump in our story, let me tell you what my plans for the miniatures are. Okay, so I plan on making these minis pretty funky. I want them to seem as if they saw battle, they are dented and battered, but they repair themselves with what they had on hand, especially the big guy. For this, I will employ more things I saved up around the house just in case I ever needed them. I applied the layer of Mod Podge mixed with black acrylic paint to add a surface that the paint would better adhere to and primed the minis at the same time. Then I went in with a zenithal priming, adding a mid-tone of administrative grey, accentuating the areas catching more light by using white paint from Pebeo, a paint that has become my favorite white paint by far. And when it comes to price, quality, quantity report, I don't think I'll find a better deal. Once that was done, I came in with Lead Belcher from Citadel as a base coat on most parts of the big miniature. I want to get those metal parts painted in early so I have a better idea of what I want to do next and then tend to the more interesting parts. 
the small construct will get the same treatment before adding the details. To get that scuffed look once the base paint is on, I will seal it with varnish and then use scratch effect fluid. The last time I used it, the fluid reactivated the paint and it smudged, driving me crazy. The varnish will prevent that, so if you want to use scratch effect fluid, I recommend you do the same. Better safe than sorry. The big guy's arms will be fiery hammers that he uses against his enemies. His torso will be the weird part filled with fire and magic, protected by a strange glassy barrier that it repurposed when repairing himself last time. Then I will paint both minis in bright colors and add scratches. It's gonna be awesome. And with that... Now that you know what I'm aiming for, it is time to go through the pre-story checklist. I have some coffee in my mug, I have some lovely apple and cinnamon tea in my moose cup, I have potato around me, she said hi earlier, and of course I have something something for the soul in the same mug because I'm starting to really like this mug. It comes with a handle, I sometimes need my something something for the soul uh, to come in a mug with a handle. Now. How about you? Are you ready for a story about blood, vengeance, manipulation, war, peace and betrayal? Also, do you have something tasty to drink on hand? Perfect, then I think it is time for a story. During Ancus Marcius' reign over in Tarquini, another city, a man by the name of Lucumo was trying to climb the social ladder but was unable to. He was looked upon with disdain by the Etruscans for he was a foreigner. He was the son of a certain Demarathus of Corinth, a Greek, who took refuge in the Italian peninsula following some conflicts in Greece. Demarathus had two sons, Lucumo and Aruns. Aruns died before his father and left behind his pregnant wife. Old Demarathus did not know he will become a grandfather so soon, so he left nothing for his grandson uh, in his will and he died before the son, the grandson was born. Upon birth, the kid was named Egerius, that translates to necessitous, needy or even pressed for poverty, take your pick. He was named this to better reflect his destiny, he was born poor. His other son, Lucumo, inherited everything and he grew proud. He married a woman by the name of Tanaquil, a wealthy woman from a very powerful Etruscan family who uh, was keen on keeping her standing in society and maintaining her way of living. The Etruscans, as I just mentioned, looked down upon Lucumo as he was the son of a banished man and a foreigner to those lands. His wife, being very proud, could not suffer how her husband was treated and so that you decided to move to Rome, a place where all were equal in opportunities and they were very, very wealthy, meaning they had more opportunities than must, like in modern days. They also chose Rome for it had been led by foreigners such as Numa Pompilius, uh, Sabine and even Ancus who was only half related to Numa. The opportunity was there and they reached out to take it. As they approached Ianiculum, part of Rome, it is said that they were sitting in their covered wagon as an eagle gently descended from the sky and stole Lucmo's cap from his head, rose a little, circled the wagon crying and then replaced the cap uh, on uh, Lucmo's head before flying away. Tanaquil hugged him and rejoiced as it was a clear sign from the gods that they looked favorably upon them, especially ab upon him. Of course, this was interpreted that the eagle removed his cap and with divine blessing it replaced it on his head. Once they bought a house and settled in, he started introducing himself as Lucius or Lucius Tarquinus Priscus or by his Roman um, pronunciation Lucius Darwinus Priscus. The nobility of the city started taking notice of this foreigner who used his wealth to slowly gain recognition. He knew how and when to use kind words, he knew how to make friends, he gave out beautiful and thoughtful gifts and slowly but surely the name Priscus was heard at the palace. 
In short time, he became known to King Ancus Marcius himself and even became an intimate friend of the king. Eventually, the king started consulting Priscus in most matters, both private and of public interest. He ended up, eventually, being named guardian of the king's children in case the king died before they came of age. By the time Ancus died, his sons were nearly of age and could easily sit on the throne very soon. It was Priscus' voice who urged the Comitia, the gathering of common citizens who were to elect the next king, to skip the interregnum and called for a vote on the next king. One day, he sent his words, Ancus' sons, away on a hunting party and he took to the Comitia where he outright asked for the throne, being the first to hold a speech advocating for the commoner's support. He reminded the commoners of his role in the city, he reminded them that he would not be the first one to ask for the mantle, but actually the third, uh, after Tatius, who started off as an enemy of Rome and then became a king in Rome, and Numa Pompilius, who although did not ask for the throne, was asked to take it, although he was a foreigner. He argued that he moved to Rome and slowly became a son of Rome, having served the city most of his life. And he also argued that he had the most exquisite of teachers in the sacred rites and in the arts of war, Ancus Marcius himself, the previous king. The people had little to nothing to argue against his statements and almost unanimously elected him as king. Livy mentions that he was the first to hold a speech in order to gain the votes of the Comitia and managed to sway the masses by essentially buying them off. He was carried to the Senate where he was placed on the throne. First order of business, he added 100 new members to the Senate, known from that moment onward as the fathers of the lesser families. These were people of common birth who gained a foothold in the Senate and formed a party that was completely loyal to the king as he was the reason they were admitted to the Curia. He did this to ensure that he had unwavering support in the Senate and that he dilutes the power of the Senate, making sure that in the eyes of the people, he was their champion. Oh, this kind of people. This, as you might expect, did not sit well with the senators. His first war was with the Latins and he sacked the city of ya, Apiole, returning with impressive spoils. Following this victory, he held games the which were never seen before in Rome. Then, under his supervision, the games became an annual occurrence. He was the first to establish an area where the Roman games, sometimes called the Great Games, were to be held and allowed the fathers of the lesser families and the Evites, the um, knights of Rome, the upper middle class, select their own seats and order that those seats be propped 3 meters in the air or almost 12 feet for a better view. The games consisted of horse races and boxers, mostly employed from the Etruscans. But you already know the drill, another story from another time as the games will get their own video. Darwinus was also known as the one who allowed private citizens purchase land around the Forum which was reserved for the state and build covered walks, promenades and booths in the forums for the leisure of citizens. Okay, now for a legend that could easily find its way in any fantasy setting. As Tarwinus was set to build stone walls around Rome, the Sabines attacked suddenly. The Romans were in disarray as it was unannounced, unprovoked and unexpected. At first they clashed with the Sabines but to no greater result. The king believed that the army was lacking in cavalry and decided to change the three Ale, the three cavalry wings established by Romulus, the Ramnes, the Titienses and the Luceres, and he wanted to add more and give them his name for posterity. When he announced this uh, before the Senate and the people, a famous augur by the name of Atus Navius opposed him and told him that because Romulus himself asked for the blessing of the gods when creating the cavalry, the king should do too so. Should do so too, <laughs> sorry. The king, angered and in a mocking way, asked the augur to ask the gods if 
what he, the king, had in mind could come to pass. Navius asked the gods and told the king that yes, what was in the king's mind would come to pass. Then the king triumphantly said, Aha! I was thinking that you could cut this uh, whetstone in two using a razor. And he pointed to a whetstone. By the way, I personally added the aha part. Livy doesn't mention it, but I like to imagine that that's what the king said to the augur. The augur took the blade and cut the stone cleanly into impressing everybody. As a result, there was a statue um, placed of Atulus at the entrance of the Senate where he performed this miracle, and it was uh, on that day that the Romans agreed that nothing of import was to be done without consulting the Augur, be it the naming of a king, declaring war, suing for peace, gathering the army, summoning the people, etc. The power and influence of the Augur uh, College also increased dramatically, as you might imagine after seeing such a miracle. After this, Tarwinus did not increase the number of, ale of cavalry, but doubled their size to 1800 horsemen divided in three wings. Because he wanted to have the last word, the new horsemen were called the New Knights, and the centuries were now called the Six Centuries uh, instead of the Three. Oh, gotcha moment. A second battle against the Sabines was fought, and with the help of the extended cavalry units, the Romans crushed the Sabines and pushed them back. Terwinus pushed forth into enemy territory and defeated them once more, forcing the Sabines to sue for peace. He also took the city of Colatia, where he left a garrison under his nephew Agerius's command. He then turned his attention to the ancient Latins who were a thorn in his side, and moved his army from one city to another without any massive decisive battle. He captured and brought under Roman rule many cities, such as Corniculum, Ficule Vetus, Cameria, Crustumerium, Ameriola, Medulia, and Nomentum. Once this was done, he returned triumphant to Rome and resumed his public works. He enclosed the whole city in stone walls, drained the lower parts of the city between the hills with sewers, and laid the foundation, to Jupi laid the foundation of Jupiter's temple on the Capitol Hill. Let us take a break in the story before we continue. But before we do so and see how the minis are coming along, hit that like button and show me that you found out something new today. Hit that subscribe button and join this growing funky community and make sure the bell is on so you are notified when a new video is out. And if you're missing my lovely assistants, Mango and Potato, make sure you check out TW Creative iPhone or minus cats, a channel with shorts that have nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. By the way, I will continue treating you to something nice, so I'm gonna give you Potito's second name, which is Sweet. Now to the meat. With the base of the metal parts now almost done and both the big guy's torso painted in a fiery pattern and its arms done, I wanted to add a little bit more contrast and magic to the whole ensemble, so I went with a bright blue for the eyes and the joints. The smaller mini will get the same treatment with both ends being painted in this color as well as its wheels and eyes. I will need two coats of this light blue for a perfect coverage though. I wish I had transparent discs for the body and the wheels for the smaller mini, that would have been so so cool. But I'm glad I have the discs fit perfectly with what I needed, so I'm not complaining too much about it. I chose this blue as it is reminiscent of magic and they are powered by ancient, long forgotten magic, so it felt appropriate. Once this step is done, I will lock everything in with varnish and start the weathering process. Till then, back to the story. Okay, one day a child uh, in the royal household was sleeping and as he was sleeping, his head burst into flame. But the kid did not wake up. Servants started calling one another to witness this miracle. The king and queen themselves witnessed it. One servant wanted to fetch some water and extinguish the poor kid's head, but the queen ordered them not to. Soon, the kid woke up with all the commotion around him and once he woke up, the flames vanished. 
I'm sure this legend can easily find a find its way in a fantasy setting, so you're welcome. Here you go, another legend that can enhance your world. So, upon witnessing all of this, the queen took the king aside and told him that this child will have an immense role to play and that he will become a protector of the royal household. She had a feeling. The kid, named Servius Tullius, was then taken in by the royal family and raised as a son taught in all the arts and sciences. There are two origin legends when it comes to Servius. The first one is that he was the kid of a servant of the palace, but the Romans of the first century BC didn't really like that story, while the second says that when Corniculum was captured by the Romans, the ruler of the city, Servius Tullius, was put to death and his wife, who was heavily pregnant, was taken to Rome. Once there, the queen recognized her unique nobility and took her in her entourage, so Servius was born and raised in the palace. Of course, there is also a third version that marries the two and says that the woman was indeed of noble birth and when Corniculum was captured, she was sent as a slave to Rome, thus Servius was born to a slave although that slave was the wife of a rival city's leader, so of noble birth. The hoops these people were jumping through because they didn't like the idea that one of their kings was born to a slave. Anyway, when he came of age, Servius became Tarquinus' son-in-law. Thirty years in Tarquinus' reign, Ancus Marcius' sons move against him. It took them long enough, honestly, but the king was beloved by the people and they had a very hard time gathering support. The two rightful heirs to the throne of Rome argued that their father's trust was broken and that even after Tarquinius' death, the throne would most likely go to his son-in-law, to a son of a slave and not them, not return to the rightful heirs. They knew that if they killed Servius, the king would be succeeded by another that would be named son-in-law. So they planned to kill the king themselves. The two um, usurped sons employed two shepherds whom they sent to Rome. The two started to brawl in front of the palace and shouted for the king to come out and enact justice. The king hearing them sent for them and they were brought before him and they started quarreling before the king even louder. They eventually settled down and started um, each telling his own story and making his own case. When the king's attention was fully on one of them, the other charged at the king and hit him in the head with an axe. He left the weapon in the king's head and both bolted for the door. The king fell but was not completely dead yet. Tanakwil ordered that all witnesses be sent away and she ordered some remedies, um, making sure that the witnesses heard her. She summoned then Servius to take over. She climbed at the top chamber of the palace and stepped out on a balcony. Below, the people were already gathered as the rumors spread. The shepherds were captured by the lictors and spirited away. The Nakwil addressed the people telling them that the king was only stunned by the blow and that the people would be able to see him in a few days after he recovered. She then said that the king ordered them to obey Servius as his words were those of the king. After the next few days, Servius, clad in royal robes, sat on the cruel chair and dispensed justice in most cases, but in some he said he would consult the king as uh, they were above his wisdom, thus maintaining the illusion that the king was recuperating and merely engaged in other business. Upon hearing that the king was alive, Servius, merely holding the fort down as he recovered and their agents captured, Ancus's sons fled in exile to Suessa Pometia. A few days later, the king died and the people were announced. People were in mourning and anger started bubbling over at the news. Servius surrounded himself with a strong elite guard and ruled without asking the people for consent, but with the blessing of the fathers of the lesser families, just so the order was kept. But not the whole senate, though. Servius found himself self-appointed king, more or less, and to ensure that 
uh, Tarquinius' sons did not hate him nor plotted for his demise, he married his two daughters to the old king's sons, Lucius or Lucius or Lucius and Aruns. Now, we shouldn't really skip over the fact that his daughters were with Tarquinius' daughter, Lucius and Aruns' sister. Thus, he married his daughters to their uncles. Cute, right? Anyway, he knew that the only way to make sure that the people would not rise up against him was a war. So he started one with the city of Vei. His military genius, bravery and fortune became legendary and upon returning victorious to the city, no one questioned his legitimacy. In times of peace, he instated something that helped shape the Roman state and is a cornerstone of modern states. He introduced the census. Although the shape of it changed over time until it reached the form we find it today. In early Roman times, it was used both to count the population and to divide the population in classes of wealth. With the census, he divided and reorganized Rome's citizens into classes and centuries, a classification that was useful both in times of peace and during war. I will only mention the general idea and details of classifications as there are pages upon pages left by living when it comes to this. Those who were worth around 100,000 aces were divided in 80 centuries, 40 representing the old and 40 the young. The old were tasked with defending the city and the young uh, were tasked with fighting outside of the city. They had to provide themselves with helmets, round shields, greaves and breastplates, all of bronze, as well as a spear and a sword. Besides these, two centuries of Fabri, or engineers, highly educated people, were added. They would not be armed, but would be responsible with building siege engines and other necessary constructions during war. And during peace, actually. They were basically the backbone of um, engineering and architecture in ancient Rome. The second class was um, between 100,000 aces and 75,000 and they had to provide oblong shields and everything above save the breastplate. They didn't have to wear a breastplate or provide themselves with a breastplate. 20 centuries of these people. The third class was uh, around 50,000 aces and they had to bring everything save the greaves. 20 centuries. The fourth class of people was around 25,000 aces and were given only a spear and a javelin, again 20 centuries. The fifth class was to bring slings and stones, 30 centuries, and beside the 30 centuries, two more centuries of trumpeteers and horn blowers were added, and anyone below 10,000 uh, aces were organized in one century and they were exempt for military service. By the way, centuries means a hundred people, in theory, but when it came to this organization of the population, it wasn't based on numbers, it was based on wealth and based on the census, but at the end of the day, the idea was that these 80 centuries, for example, would then divide into groups of a hundred people and out of each hundred people, they had to give to provide one soldier for every hundred people, I believe. I think I'm not mistaken. I will talk about the military organization of the Roman Republic and uh, Monarchy Republic and Empire at a later date, but you know the drill, another story for another time. Now, please note that only the men were counted for the census as they were the ones providing military services. Um, he then extended the number of horsemen and decreed that unmarried women were to care for the horses by paying 2,000 aces per year each. The procurement of horses would be paid by the state and having the centuries provide their men with weapons actually shifted the burden from the poor to the rich. Every century, every 100 people had to give one soldier and equip that soldier. Now the catch. The poor no longer had to support the army and the cavalry, but they weren't entitled to vote either. Officially they were still able to vote, of course, but it went like this. 
In matters of import, such as naming the king, first they Evites, the uh, middle class, upper middle class uh, knights of Rome would vote. Then if the vote was inconclusive or they couldn't agree upon a candidate, the first class of citizens, the first 80 centuries, would be called upon to vote. If they failed to come to a consensus or to a result, the second class citizens, all 20 centuries, would be brought forth and they would have to vote, and so on and so forth. If they didn't manage to come to a consensus, the next class would be called upon. But most things of import would usually be agreed upon before reaching the second class citizens, let alone the fifth class or the last class of citizens. So, in theory, they still had a voice. In practice, no, not really. Because nowadays we have a weird fear of being counted in the census, at least some people avoid it like it's the bloody plague for some reason. This was the case in ancient Rome as well. People didn't want to be counted in the census. But uh, Servius ordered everyone to participate in it or face a death penalty. Once the census was done, he summoned all citizens to Campus Martius, Field of Mars, what is now uh, the Vatican City, and organize, against, uh, organize according to century. 80,000 soldiers were then enlisted to serve the city, uh, not necessarily on a permanent basis, but they were the first to be called upon. The king then added three more hills to Rome, the Virinal, the Viminal, and he took, he took over the Esquiline and enlarged it, then moved his residence there to make it more desirable to the people. He then extended the walls and the ramparts of the city, uh, as well as the Pomerium, the area uh, on either side of the wall, the area that is left clear, uh, in front of the walls so you can see the enemy approaching and behind the walls to um, give soldiers room to maneuver and to um, reinforce the area and to prevent fires. Okay, now let's take a moment, see how the minis are coming along before we continue with our story. With the paint all applied over the scratch effect fluid, I went in with a wooden skewer to make some deep scratches and with a paintbrush with pretty hard bristles to start weathering the paint. Now, I made a mistake. Being pretty late and me being tired when working on this mini, I did not take an extra 5 minutes for the paint to properly dry, so when going in with a brush, the scratches formed but the paint smudged. 5 minutes more, that's all it needed, but lessons learned. A second mistake that I made was using edge paints instead of layer paints and they don't cover metallic paints all that well, but in the end, I think it does add to the overall weather defect. These are constructs that were dormant for thousands and tens of thousands of years. The paint would get a little warped in that period of time, so I'm not too upset about it. Next time I will have learned my lessons and do a better job. Until then. Back to our story. Okay, let's continue. Soon enough, Lucius Tarwinus started poking the king by saying that he was ruling without the consent of the people. This, of course, got to Servius as he felt the sting of guilt. He divided land taken from the enemy through military conquest and gave it to the poorest of the Roman citizens, dividing it uh, so that everybody got something only the most, not only the poorest, but he started with the poorest of the Roman citizens and they were the first to receive some land so they, they would move up a class perhaps. Once this was done, he summoned the Comitia and asked them to vote if he should be their king. They voted with such overwhelming consensus like no other king before him, not even uh, Numa Pompilius. But Lucius changed his tune and immediately started goading the senators, being sure that they did not like nor agree with the action undertaken by the king, as that land should have belonged to them so they could get even richer. But the king gave it to the people, trying to lift them from poverty. Of course, he actually tried to buy them. It's very clear, but still, he did something that helped people 
raised from poverty. Now, because most of the times history is much, much better than movies, let's turn our attention to Lucius, Aruns, and their wives, Servius's daughters. Lucius's wife was soft spoken and lacked ambition, while Aruns' wife, Tulia, was very ambitious and thirsty for power. Lucius and Tulia started an affair and encouraged each other in their plots with Tulia saying that if she would have married Lucius instead of his brother, she long ago would have been queen, uh, taking power from her father. She took every opportunity to humiliate her husband, who did not thirst for power as she did. He was laid back, he wanted to learn, to study, to travel and to enjoy life. She wanted power. But let's be clear. She was the daughter of the king, a princess, married to the son of a previous king. So, she had it all. Eventually, mysteriously enough, Lucius' wife dies of unknown causes. Very shortly after, Aruns died in similar mysterious circumstances. Tulia and Lucius, both heartbroken, were now open for marriage and searching for their soulmates and they found each other. It was love at first sight. Servius tolerated this union but did not approve of it, but there was little he could do. Egged on by his own ambition and nature and the constant bickering of his new wife, Lucius Lucius Tarwinus started searching for support among the fathers of the lesser families. Some were outright bought, others were promised great things, but all were reminded that his father, Tarwinus Priscus, was the one who granted them entrance in the Senate, and now it was time for them to repay the favor. And then, one fateful evening, Tarwinus walked in the Senate with a heavy escort and through heralds summoned all senators to the Curia, before King Tarwinus. They came. Some knew what was happening. Others were afraid of what might happen if they didn't obey. Tarwinus then besmirched Servius's origin, saying that he was the son of a slave who took the throne from his father. There was no interregnum, no election by the people, no confirmation by the senate. He robbed the rich of their lands and divided it among the rabble, and then he created the census to show the poorest of the poor how much more the wealthy had, sowing discontent and jealousy, making the rich pay more instead of all shouldering the burden equally, with the census allowing the king to tax the rich more than he taxed the poor. Like, duh, it's like nowadays when the rich barely pay anything while the poor, oh boy, better hold on to your damn shoelaces, you might need them the next time you make a damn stew. Sorry, but it's beyond me how the poorest were supposed to shoulder the burden equally with the rich and pay the same taxes when they had nothing to eat. The poor got some land off of which they still had to pay taxes, it was not tax-free. So they, they got the land that they got to work so they could pay taxes to the state, then the senators would still benefit. It's like nowadays when you hear, especially the right going on on how the poor should pay more taxes and how the rich should uh, uh, be granted exemptions. Anyway, not going into that. And, let's be honest, the fucking prick actually came to power because his father usurped the throne and he was born with everything. He was the king of a son and then he was married to the next king's daughter. People, right? Anyway, Servius came to the senate aroused by the news and confronted Tarwinus, accusing him of not even having the common decency of waiting for him to die first before sitting in his chair. Tarwinus answered mockingly that it was actually his father's chair, and that for too long a slave mocked his masters and superiors by sitting on it and playing king. 
the Senate immediately divided in two and shouting ensued between the supporters of either party. The people were drawn to the Curia by the commotion. Tarwinus went all in and picked up old King Servius by the waist and threw him down the steps of the Senate. The old king, barely being able to stand up, made his way back to the Esquilin, to his house, alone, without an escort or anybody to help. But Lucius Tarwinus was not done. He wanted more, so he sent people after the king and had him killed in the street, only meters away from his house. It is said that Tulia, who witnessed it all, was sent by her husband back home as spirits were getting uh, more uh, fiery. She passed in her carriage before the house of her father. The driver shouted and pointed out his disfigured body, while people in the streets were calling for the guards and for help. She ordered that he drive on, and legend has it, she ordered the carriage driver drive over her dead father's body, getting some of the blood on her carriage and even her clothing, thus drawing the gods and fate's anger. Servius Tullius reigned for 42 years and he was beloved, leaving a mark on Rome and the world. It is said that royalty died with him that evening, being the last true king of Rome. Ancient writers believe that he was about to resign the throne as he was basically a government of one man as the senators did not really support him, but he was murdered before he could do so, so we will never know if that was really his plan. With his death, the reign of the last Roman king, Lucius Tarquinus Superbus, or Lucius Tarquinus the Proud, began. And oh boy, is it a wild ride. But this is where we will leave the story as Tarquinus deserves his own video. Let's take one last look at the miniatures before we wrap things up. With the minis now done, with the big guy's innards in place and the weird glass body set, with the scratches and the runes all in place, with the varnish on and dried, it is time to add the last few details that will enhance the minis. With cold water and hot glue, I am borrowing from glass making and I am creating Prince Rupert's drops out of glue. These are tear shaped beads that will go on the minis. It takes a few tries before I get the shapes I want, but it's not a long process. Just make sure that the glue is really hot. Once they are shaped, I just adjust the length of the tails to what I'm looking for and voila, Prince Rupert's drops. I'm using a bit of hot glue to fix them in place and then using fluorescent orange ink, I'm painting them to look like fire. Potato actually dropped by to inspect my work and give the all clear. She seemed very happy with how things turned out. So, as I was saying, fluorescent orange inks to make them look like fire. They add a little bit more weirdness to the minis and I am very happy with that. I feel like I gained some XP and leveled up. Although they look weird, they are made from scratch and they turned out much better than I expected. And with that, our story comes to an end for now. I want to thank you so much for the privilege of your time and I truly hope you found out something new and found some inspiration today. And I can't wait to see you all funky people next time here on Funky Monkey MP. The place where you get your dose of mini painting, history, world building and trivia. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe and make sure you share this video with everybody, your family, friends, GMs, DMs, neighbors, everybody, if you like them. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never stop world building and creating awesome things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are amazing and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers.
under his nephew um, Aegerius in command, so of normal birth, so of normal taking the power from here 